So um, the focus on this conference clearly has been squarely on resilience, uh, resilience of people and ecosystems in light of climate change and its inevitable surprises. I come to this topic in part as an academic ecologist, but also as a former government official at the head of NOAA, the lead US agency for climate science and assessments, forecasting extreme weather and managing ocean and coastal areas on the front lines of climate change. And then as a former US science envoy for the ocean doing science diplomacy in Asia and Africa. And now in the White House, leading the climate and environment team at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Now, uh, I also join you though <clears throat> with a shared and deep sense of concern and urgency. Uh, Joaquin began by noting a very specific anniversary of a deadly flood in his country. Chancellor Cardinal Turkson globalized our focus with graphic images uh, of the gifted vocalist singing P.F. Sloan's lyrics, Eve of Destruction, popularized by Barry McGuire. And I venture to guess that each of us has both firsthand experiences with bizarre extreme weather that deepen our shared global concerns. And for me, this is the one year, first year anniversary of an unprecedented heat dome over the Pacific Northwest of North America that turned our typical 23 to 26 degrees C Oregon weather into deadly and persistent scorching temperatures up to 47 degrees centigrade with a mind boggling 49.6 degrees recorded in British Columbia just across the Canadian border. And you can see in this image the jet stream stuck in this wobbly pattern that uh, Dr. Schellenuber mentioned. <clears throat> the, the team at the World Weather Attribution calculated that these unprecedented temperatures were made 150 times, 150 times more likely by climate change. The death toll was over 1,400 people and economic damages of $8.9 billion. This was completely a surprise, completely unprecedented. Nobody thought this could or would happen, and yet it did. And many of these surprises are exactly that. Some are predicted, some are just smacking us uh, out of nowhere. The previous summer, Oregon suffered a very different climate-related disaster. It had the dubious distinction of having the worst air quality in the world, in the entire world, as wildfires raged across the state and in the neighboring states of Washington and California. The soot from those fires, seen in this image, and the smoke were transported across the continent and polluted air far, far from the source. This is not unique, but it's just a very specific example. Similar disasters are happening around the world and every part of the world is affected by this extreme weather. We're being caught off guard. And so it's worse than anticipated uh, and it's going to get worse and surprises will continue to happen. And of course the underserved and poor populations are bearing the brunt everywhere. So. Yes, we are right to be concerned, and we each bring to this conversation our own experiences, our own passion, and our knowledge, but also a desire to do something. Climate change is palpable and scary, and this extreme weather is only one symptom. Now, many of you have spoken or written eloquently about the ways in which our understanding of climate change has evolved. For example, from a sole focus on the physical system to one that also incorporates biology. That was a big deal when it first happened. Then from a biogeophysical focus to one that also incorporates human behavior, another breakthrough. Later from a sole focus on mitigation to a dual focus on mitigation and adaptation. And this journey of opening the aperture continues today. We are not where we need to be. We need to look beyond this. 
And just as the powerful new Webb telescope of NASA's is providing astounding new images of the universe that will lead to improved knowledge, so too does new information about our own planet improve our understanding. And some of that new information is the focus of my remarks, the intersection of climate change with other major forces that also affect resilience of people and ecosystems. And I refer specifically to the other two major challenges to society, in addition to the climate crisis, were confronted by a biodiversity crisis and an equity crisis. And my remarks focus on the intersection of these. So in the government, we always start talks or write memos with the bottom line up front bluff. So here's my bottom line up front. One, we will not be able to achieve resilience in the face of climate change unless we tackle climate, biodiversity, and equity together. They're intimately intertwined, they interact. Each affects resilience and a focus on only one will not succeed. Number two, a focus on biodiversity is not only important in and of itself, but it can significantly enhance the effectiveness of actions to address climate. Yet, the climate community is mostly stuck in a climate silo. It's also, as an aside, stuck in a mitigation silo, and a technology silo, and a land silo. So we have a lot of other apertures to open up. And finally, we need not wait to invent new solutions. We have solutions in hand, they just are not at the scale that are needed for success. So <clears throat> just to put a point on it, we're confronted by changes to the planet and people that are in fact interrelated, but we treat them as separate. Let's delve a little deeper into the biodiversity loss, the one in the center here. Now, many people, this image sort of uh, encourages that, but many people think of biodiversity as equivalent to either charismatic species, charismatic critters, lions, tigers, polar bears, koalas, um, or just number of species. But indeed, it refers to all of nature the interactions among plants, animals, and microbes, and people, and the benefits that nature provides to us. Just as we have the IPCC for climate change, we have the IPBES, IPBES, for loss of biodiversity, international interdisciplinary scientific assessments of the state of knowledge. There are eight IPBES reports to date, and they summarize what we know, the rates at which we're losing biodiversity, thousands of times faster than background levels, why it's happening, and why it matters. Now, it may surprise you to know that although climate change is a huge threat to biodiversity, it is far from the major immediate threat. Habitat degradation on land and overfishing in the ocean are the biggest threats to nature loss. So to stem the loss of biodiversity, to enhance resilience of ecosystems and people, we need to pay attention to habitat loss, habitat conversion on land. Most of that is for agriculture. And we need to pay attention to overfishing in the ocean. Nature affects everything we care about, health, well-being, equity, prosperity, Nature provides food, clean water, shelter, cultural identity, inspiration, and so much more. It truly provides the life support system for the planet. Now, these services, these benefits that we get from nature result from the interactions of the plants, animals, and microbes in the system. When ecosystems lose genetic or species diversity, they lose resilience. When we modify biogeochemical cycles, ecosystems lose resilience. When we change the climate, ecosystems lose resilience. They can no longer absorb change or adapt, and they cease to provide the range of benefits that we want and need. Now, an effective way to enhance the resilience of people and ecosystems is to protect the functioning 
of an ecosystem, not to focus on specific goods like tons of fish or board feet of timber, but the functioning of the system, the delivery of the full range of benefits. And now this means keeping it intact and minimizing the loss of species and genetic diversity. Coastal ecosystems, such as salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrass beds provide a wealth of benefits to people. We call these ecosystem services. For example, blue carbon ecosystems actively sequester carbon. In fact, they can sequester up to 10 times as much carbon per unit area as a forest. Mangroves also provide a profusion of other benefits. They stabilize shorelines and protect against coastal erosion, especially in light of sea level rise. They protect inland areas from storm surge and act as speed bumps for hurricanes. They provide nursery habitat for economically important fisheries and critical habitat for birds. They provide valuable timber and leaves for example, for canoes or weaving and medicines for people in many parts of the world. Microbes in the sediment that these mangroves trap detoxify pollutants and trapping of the sediments protects downstream coral reefs. So mangroves also therefore provide jobs and livelihoods. They support valuable fisheries and tourism. And in short, they provide mitigation and adaptation benefits, plus biodiversity and equity benefits. And yet they are among the most threatened habitats in the world. So example number two are marine protected areas. These are very powerful but underutilized tools. They are powerful only if they are fully or highly protected i.e. no or very minimal extractive activities allowed. No mining, no drilling, no oil or gas, no fishing. They are powerful but underutilized. Currently, only 2.8% of the global ocean, 2.8% is in fully or highly protected MPAs, and scientists tell us we need about 30%. There's a current move underway called 30 by 30, protect 30% 30 of the global ocean by 2030. We're making progress. It, uh, 25 years ago, we were at 0.01%. So uh, we're making progress, but we are not there yet. Um, there is a profusion of scientific literature that says that MPAs work. They provide a wealth of benefits, including protecting biodiversity. When you set up a marine protected area that's fully protected, you stop fishing in it, uh, there is a huge increase in biomass, uh, in density of species. These are averages across over 400 uh, different studies of uh, marine protected areas. Increases in size and a 21% increase on average in diversity. So huge imp impact on biodiversity. They also enhance resilience to environmental change and protect by promoting genetic diversity that in fact is the raw material for adaptation. Fully protected MPAs can also restore the ecological balance by restoring the top predators in the system. Th those top predators can in turn control uh, the rest of the food web. They can buffer against mismanagement uh, because they protect the very, very large fish, they allow them to get big, and those larger fish produce a lot more offspring, then fisheries can recover inside, and some of that bounty spills out to adjacent areas outside. And so they not only protect biodiversity, but can help, in some cases, uh, recover depleted fisheries. So Fully or highly protected MPAs provide a huge number of benefits, some of which I've mentioned, but I wanna draw your attention to one that's been quantified recently. And this is protecting stores of carbon. As it turns out, the seabed has been accumulating carbon for millennia in, in many places. 
uh, and there is twice as much carbon in the upper meter of the seafloor as there is on all terrestrial soils combined. Uh, protecting those stores of carbon is a very smart move. Uh, protecting it from trawling or mining that stirs up the sediment, uh, volatilizes that carbon, and some of that carbon, uh, although we don't know exactly what fraction yet, can be released into the atmosphere. So MPAs uh, are uh, an untapped opportunity here. The same is true uh, of a number of other tools, but I want to focus on the ocean just more broadly. The ocean as a system has much greater potential to address climate, biodiversity, and equity, but we continue to squander its riches. Um, this report that was published in 2019, Scientific Synthesis, uh, suggests that the ocean is not only a victim of climate change, but also a powerful source of mitigation options. And it quantified the actual uh, mitigation potential from a wide range of coastal and oceanic uh, activities and concluded that the ocean could provide up to 21%, one-fifth, of the annual greenhouse gas emission reductions needed by 2050 to get us to the 1.5 degree target. So this was an opportunity that until this study was really not on people's radar screen. And so I said, we are stuck in a land-based silo. We can now open the aperture and think about the ocean as additional powerful opportunities for uh, mitigating climate change, and then also there's adaptation benefit to many of those. Um, building on those examples, um, many governments, businesses, and global leaders are beginning to incorporate biodiversity and nature into more holistic approaches to achieve resilience, but these are not at the scale that are that is needed yet. Uh, and I highlight uh, just a few examples here uh, some of which are activities that we are uh, tackling uh, within, uh, led by the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, but also some other opportunities. And I would draw your attention to an executive order that President Biden signed on Earth Day this year that sets in motion three things. One, a new national nature assessment. The US has never taken stock of the nature that it has, how it's changing, why it matters, or what might be done to that. We have a national climate assessment. Now we will also have a national nature assessment. This will be like uh, the national climate assessment, like the IPCC and it best come out every four to five years. Um, we also are setting in motion natural capital accounts, something that a number of other countries have begun to do to actually quantify the economic benefits of nature. Currently, we rely heavily on GDP as the indicator of economic activity. Uh, it was not designed to, it does not capture uh, nature. Uh, natural capital accounts can do that and help us understand how changes how decisions are affecting nature that, that in turn affect the economy. And finally, a stronger focus on nature-based solutions for climate change and other things. Um, other countries are uh, joining forces to tackle some of these issues together. And 16, 16 countries now, 16 heads of state or government have uh, come together to form what is called the High-Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. Um, these 16 uh, include uh, three in uh, North America, uh, three in South America and the Caribbean, uh, three in Africa, three in Europe, uh, and four, five, let's see, Japan, Indonesia, Australia, Fiji, and Palau in uh, Asia, Indonesia. Um, these countries represent about uh, almost half of the world's EEZs. So even though 16 countries is not a large number, they actually represent a fair amount of the exclusive economic zones of the world. 25% of the fisheries, 20%. Yes? We are sort of running out of time. 
Okay, I'm almost through, thank you. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, and the global, uh, the ocean panel uh, has this uh, tripartite uh, vision of protecting the ocean effectively, producing from it sustainably, <laughs> and prospering from it equitably. Um, on the corporate side, 10 companies now, major seafood companies, in the largest in the world, are now working together towards sustainable uses of the ocean, uh, led by the Stockholm Resilience Center or facilitated by them uh, in a very innovative way. And finally, of course, uh, Pope Francis's Laudato Si, uh, bringing moral leadership to the fore and a moral voice that talks about the importance of people and nature, uh, especially the most poor and vulnerable, but also our moral responsibilities. And so pulling all these together, uh, as we think about enhancing resilience, valuing biodiversity, minimizing the most immediate threats, protecting intact ecosystems, partnering with local communities, indigenous peoples, and tightening the feedback loops between action and consequence and seeing these as really as complex adaptive systems uh, is what I think we need to do. So again, with the bottom line up front, I leave you with a message of urgency and hope through a holistic people-centric approach, recognizing that ecosystems are composed of people and nature and they provide our life support systems. Thank you very much indeed.